Uh, good morning. Hear me now. Harold, I want to thank you for that. It was very inspiring, very beautiful to, to consider in that story. I remember years ago when you told me about that, you decided to stop whining. It was you. You were the baby. <laughs> no, he, but it was, it was beautiful because he said, you know, I just decided God knows what I want. I keep asking, keep crying out. I'm just going to start thanking. That's the, that's the language of faith right there. Start thanking God for what he is going to do and what he will do. And when we trust God, just giving him our all and everything that is a part of who we are. I want you to be, uh, turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Thank you. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, known as the Sermon on the Mount beginning here in chapters 5, 6, and 7. The teaching of Jesus Christ to his disciples as he came to them and began to teach them. And he begins with a series of blessings. So it says here, seeing the multitude, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. So I want you to notice even the context of, of this message. He was up on a mountain, his disciples came to him. Right? So they're coming to him, and then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, it's interesting as we go through and we look at the different things that Christ was saying, blessed are you if you are doing this, or if you are this way, or if this happens to you. And we can look at these things and, and, and maybe have a, a wonderment about how this works, or what do I need to do, and how do I need to develop, or, you know, I, I hear a lot of times, well, you know, you get those last verses, blessed are they when they revile and persecute, and say all kinds of things falsely for my name's sake. And how that can be so difficult and so hard to go through when, when you have those experiences. When somebody's accusing you falsely, when somebody's telling you that you're doing evil, when really what you're doing is, is trying to do what's right, trying to do what's good, trying to do what's just. And in fact, he says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. That's an interesting heart, isn't it? When someone is saying something falsely against you. When somebody is persecuting you, that's not natural, is it? Our natural tendency is to justify ourselves, to fight back, to say, no, 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 you don't get it, and, and get into an argument and trying to defend ourselves. And God is saying that when this happens to you, what does he say? Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Is that somewhere else? Is that a thinking that's somewhere else? You have to see life in a different way than we see growing up in this world, right? We have to see life in a different way. When we come to Jesus Christ, we are being challenged to look at life in a different way than what we knew and what we've known growing up in this world in the way that we operate as families and peoples and nations in this world to think differently. And the challenge that is, is, is looked at when we say, how is it that you can be accused falsely when 
people can revile you and be mean unjustly. And rather than it being the natural response to get angry and to fight back, that I will actually rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Where do we go? How do we come to this point that that's our heart, that that's what's going on? What is it that we see that causes us to respond that way? It's awesome. Now, I want us to look at these phrases that Jesus was, was talking about here. Blessed are the poor. So when we read that, what does it mean? Blessed are the poor in spirit. The word poor, helpless, needy, powerless, lacking in anything, lowly and destitute. So as Christ begins to open his mouth to teach his disciples, the first thing he says as they come to him for instruction is blessed. The word bless is a word that comes from a Hebrew word, makar. Makarios is the word bless there. Makar means be happy. And an extension of what a blessing is or being blessed, it's the extension of what God is doing you're blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So the, even the connotation of happiness seems off almost from the beginning, doesn't it? That he's, that he's using a word that means happy, and yet he's saying it's to be of a spirit that's needy, helpless, powerless, lacking in anything, lowly and destitute. This is where Jesus begins his message. Blessed are those who have this spirit, the poor in spirit. He goes on. Blessed are those who mourn. What? Happiness, right? The happiness that comes from a blessing, the joy that comes. Blessed are those who mourn. They cry, they wail. They grieve over hope that dies. They rend themselves. Never forget a, a time, and my, my children remind me of it from time to time. There was some, uh, a person that we were fairly close with and uh, who I knew well who did the most horrific thing you can do to a human being, at least on this earth, took their life. And he took the life of somebody he loved. And he did it in a very heinous way. I remember that day because I could not control the depth of grief that hit me. There was no being professional about it. There was no sucking it up. I, it, was, it was an uncontainable grief and sorrow. And my children, well, they never saw their father cry. And never cry like that, for sure. Because I'd only ever cried like that in a time of repentance. There's only been a few occasions in my life where I wailed and mourned. But one was knowing someone that I loved and cared about had done a vicious act of, of murder. But the others took place before the Lord where I couldn't control. I was so undone. But I want you to see the way the Lord starts his teaching. The, the way instruction comes. In seeing, blessed are you who lament or grieve over hope that dies, that are rending themselves. It's interesting, isn't it? The contrast. Meek. Blessed are the meek. Those who have a gentle spirit that is surrendered to God, that is teachable, and what I like about the understanding of this word and meekness, it's a humility that basically says, I'm done disputing with you whether you're right, God, and I'm done rejecting or resisting what you want me to do. Moses was called the meekest man of the earth. And basically, it, it meant in his way of thinking, God, you're everything. And I get it. And I don't have any place to stand before you, I can only stand 
as you caused me to, but I'm not going to resist you in my life. So he says, blessed are you who are poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom. Blessed are you who mourn, for you will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, right? For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What does that mean? To crave ardently, passionately. You know what it is to be hungry, right? You know that feeling of pain and like, ugh, I gotta eat, I'm so hungry, right? Or to be thirsty, I just need some water, I need something to drink. I'm, that, the pain that comes with the, the need that you have. You know you need something. And God is saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for his righteousness. And that word righteousness basically is all that comes with it. It's the righteousness that comes when you stand before God in a state of righteousness. That you know when you receive the forgiveness of God and the love of God. It's the righteousness that comes because God shows you the right way. He gives you teaching. He shows you what is good and right. And you stand in that, that you would hunger for his ways. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So it's a hungry and a thirsting. It's knowing the need that you have, understanding that. One of the most deceptive things in life is to walk around on this earth and not recognize the hunger and thirst that we have for God Almighty. But the blessing comes when we understand it and see it and know it, and we become acquainted with what we need to eat and drink, that which comes from Almighty God. And God says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst, they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, full of mercy, a spirit of generosity, where it is unmerited and undeserved. It's an interesting thing that you notice in society. Acts of mercy continually are evaluated whether they're merited or not. That kind of wrecks the mercy aspect of it. Mercy is something that's uh, it, it, it's, it's coming because it's needed. Someone sees the need for the mercy, whether it's in an act of kindness or an act of forgiveness. When it's true mercy, it means that they're not in a position to do it. If judgment was required, if you were doing it based on the merits, well then, you're just giving them what they deserve. But Mercy is the thought of God's heart. He sends his rain on the just and the unjust. That's mercy. He is kind to the unthankful and the evil. That's the way he sees things. That's the way he does and lives life. So blessed are the merciful. They shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. What does that mean? To be clean, pure, free from impurity and sin, genuine in your very core. That the way that you're living life is, is free from sin and the effects of sin in the way that you walk on this earth, the way that you see people, the way that you make decisions about your life, there's a cleanness about it. So it's a purity of heart. It talks in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 to 8, it says that we should keep the feast not with the old leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The, the word sincerity, it's, it's a word that basically means and comes from the idea of passing a test where you could hold a vessel up to the sunlight, and the brightness of the sun would demonstrate whether it was true or not, whether there were cracks in it or any impurities in it. Was it truly pure and good? And so, in the same sense, God is saying, and Christ is saying, blessed are you when you're pure in heart, when the impurities are gone and the way you're living life is clean, that the desires are clean, the way you treat people is clean, and the pure in heart see God. The pure in heart, it says, they shall see God. And one of the things that's amazing when we start to think about this change of attitude that, I, that we talked about. How do you come to this point of, of seeing the world so differently? In a sense, to be pure in heart toward another person is to see 
them the way God sees them and to see what is happening in their life the way God sees it so that your heart is pure and right, that your heart is pure toward that person, and it affects everything. So blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, those who work, who make peace to put an end to conflict and strife. How is peace made? How is peace made? In this world, you realize the disruption of peace comes because we have sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God. We are selfish creatures. We've learned to act in selfish ways, to protect ourselves from hurts, from pains, from all the things that come in our lives. And that's what we spread to each other. Hurt begets hurt. Sin begets sin. That's the nature of the world that we live in. But the peacemaker becomes like a stopper of what's happening. See, the application of Jesus Christ's sacrifice is an application of peace to put an end to sin. All sin that can flow around the earth, it all stops at the cross of Jesus Christ. He absorbs it. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And when iniquity starts to flow, the only way to produce a peace in our lives when we're being sinned against or we see sin happening, we've got to take it to the cross to know Christ and allow him to absorb the cursing of sin so that what we're producing and what we're reflecting is not a bounce back. If sin hits here, sin goes back. But as the sin hits here, it's reflected to the cross, and the peace of the cross gets pushed back out. That's what God desires. That's what God's looking for. So blessed are the peacemakers. What do they demonstrate? That they're sons of God, because they're acting like the Son of God. They're acting as He acts. They're doing as He does to absorb the curse and to respond with blessing. So blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are you when you are persecuted. Blessed. Again, remember the root word for blessed, happy. When you're harassed, troubled, mistreated, molested, persecuted, pursued in a hostile manner. And for what purpose? For righteousness. It's the same righteousness that God said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. That filling that comes from God that you know is good is going to be the reason that you may be persecuted for his goodness. And he's saying that's a good thing. See, again, when you think about what you know of God's goodness toward you, when you think of the mercies or the gentleness or the power of God, and it comes into our lives, you know it's good. And when somebody attacks what God is doing or somebody attacks what goes on and, and starts to go after that in a negative way, it's easy then to want to say start defending, right? Defending what God has done, defending what God is doing. And somebody might be looking at the righteousness that God is working out and be judging it, evaluating it, persecuting you for it, just as, right, the two covenants, the first covenant, and those of the first covenant attacking those of the second covenant, not seeing the righteousness of God. But the thing is, it's not to be responding to defend, to justify, to do anything other than what? To Love, what does he say? Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Do you see that there's a non-response? There's a non-response to it because the heart and attitude isn't about giving back as people may give to us. What we are pushing out is the grace of God that he has given to us, the blessing that comes from him. Blessing are you reviled. 
Again, undeserved reproach to upbraid, finding fault, berated, chastised for the righteousness. Rejoice, here's the definition, exceedingly. So when someone is coming to you and they are berating you, chastising you, condemning you, finding fault because of the things that God is working in righteousness in your life, he says, get giddy. (laughs) Get happy. Rejoice because you see what is happening. The light of Christ, and as Christ's lights come, it will always create a stirring up. But realize that the stirring up that comes is actually part of the process that needs to take place. It's a stirring up that can be for his good if it's used for his good, or it can be for bad if the stirring up comes and creates argument, creates fighting, creates the conflict that the peacemaker wants to absorb, not perpetuate. I want to say something uh, to this, this church. We, we have people that come and pray at the front of church after services. And when we have people come to pray, we want you to be able to come and to receive prayer from somebody who I have experienced with in my life and have seen that, one, they were comfortable and willing to come up for prayer, Every person that we have on the prayer team was somebody that came and said, would you please pray for me, where I have known them to confess or to be seeking God's help, to be looking to God, asking for help and blessing, asking for forgiveness. And they saw the power of God that came from prayer. I know that that's probably the story of many of you, but I've had experiences with them. And I asked these people to do that because... I know that they were comfortable receiving prayer, therefore they would be comfortable helping someone else pray, knowing that the power was not of man, but of God. But I also want you to know this, that whether you come up to the front for prayer or not is not what we are after in having people up at the front to pray. What are we after? We're after the encouragement and the availability to help you in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Bottom line. This is, this is open. We don't charge anybody, you know. You know, you used to have to pay in the old days for your pews. You guys realize that, right? You know, I haven't received any pew offerings yet, you know. But that's why they have these churches, the evangelical free, right? They didn't charge you for your pew, But in the old days, you had a family pew. You had a family place to sit in a church. You paid to have it, and that's where you got to sit. We don't charge. It's free. This building is a gift. This time is a gift. This ministry is a gift. It's offered to you to partake of, but it's not based on controlling you, having numbers here. It's based on saying, This is what we have to serve you with. If you can be served, you're welcome to it. And if you can't be served, you're welcome to not have it. That's what it is. It is an offering of availability. That's it. But what happens sometimes is you can have things where people start to see God's hand working in their lives, and then they see a new reality which is good. Do you know how that gets treated in the flesh? It can puff you up and cause you to look down on those who you think haven't got it. And you know what it does to those who are looking at it and say, well, I didn't see that. Rather than saying, I'm so glad it happened to you, they start judging the people that have received something different, and they're wondering about that. And I'm going to tell you, when God starts to move in a person, these conflicts go on between flesh and spirit. And when it happens in a church, it happens the same way. And you know what I say, when you start to see sides or argument or debate or wonderings about this, we got it, you don't, you don't understand, it's weird, it's why. You know what, you know what I say? I, I, I see what, 
what's going on. We want to look at the specific issues. We don't realize what's going on. When people are looking back and forth and going side to side in the church of God, it's just all flesh. You're both wrong. You're both wrong. And it comes from a root of pride on both sides, which is the key thing that happens in the hearts of us fleshly people. Because there's not a poverty of spirit. I'm okay. I don't need that. You need that. What, what do you know? See, the offering of love is saying, I'm available to serve you. If someone wants to receive of the service, they may. If somebody declines it, it's not an offense. For you do not know that maybe it's happening somewhere completely different. When we were at the Feast of Tabernacles, I got sick. Came on me really fast. I don't know if it was allergies or a cold and God just healed me because it only lasted a few hours. But I mean, I was laid waste and I came back from having lunch and I was just out. I mean, I was just looking terrible, feeling terrible. And I'm like, I, I'm no good right now. And I, I had no energy. I just laid down and went to sleep for a few hours. As I woke up, I'm laying in my bed and immediately, all I have is a, a spirit of wanting to worship God. It was so powerful and so strong. And I realized he was just taking care of me and loving me, but I just wanted to start worshiping him. And as I was worshiping him there alone in my bedroom, he just kept coming on me and causing me to repent, showing me things in my life I needed to confess showing me places where I had given provision to things in this world, little entertainments that I went to for comfort or relief or just at the end of a tired day that I had gone to because I felt tired from work. And God said, I want all of that. I want to be the one that when you're so tired at the end of the day that you come to for, the, for your delight and your little bit of entertainment and pleasure. I want, to, I want to have even those little moments. I want it all. And I was so happy with that. But I was able to go through a process, be physically healed from whatever it was that was plaguing me, to come to a confession and repentance, to receive healing from God. And it was just me and God. I didn't go to the prayer night. There was a prayer meeting happening at that time. I wasn't there. So God deals with us in different ways at different times. It's foolish to think if somebody doesn't come up to the front that they're not getting it. And if I hear that, I'm going to tell you we got to go back to the basic beginnings of what we're doing. That evaluation is just off. This is an offering of service to those who want prayer from somebody who's available. But you might have some friend that's better to pray with. Your prayer and repentance might be taking place in a home. The point of the service that what we do here is to encourage you to come to God to receive from Him. And I don't want anybody to leave a service thinking they didn't make available anybody to pray with me and I was in need. That's why we have a prayer team. I want somebody to be available when you have a need and you need to be prayed for. But these things, these things that God is showing us to be exceedingly glad and helpful. Look at this word, blessed, from the root word meaning happy, a happy state due to receiving God's provision and His grace either directly or through another, the extension of God's grace to a person to be made holy, consecrated, and I want you to focus on that last phrase, connected to God. You see, when we talk about blessing in the context of the Scripture and the Word of God, what we're really talking about is, I am blessed because I'm connected to Him who provides all blessing, from whom all blessings flow. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. It's God. The connection is with God. The blessing is with God. Why am I happy? 
Because I'm connecting to him. So when you go back and you look at the, the uh, beginnings of where we were to be poor, the realization of the poverty, the helplessness, the need, the powerlessness, the lack of anything, that is where it begins. We can look at these things in life. We can look at the teachings of Jesus Christ and say, well, you know, yeah, yeah, I need to be poor in spirit, mourn, need to be meek, yeah. But how do I really hunger and thirst? I need a Bible study more. Yeah, I need to be more merciful. I'm not very forgiving. I need to be more of a peacemaker. Because I know, and, and you know what? When people do, when they, when they chastise me for, for something that I didn't do wrong, man, I'm right back in their face. So you, you can look at these lists and you can say, I need to work on that. I need to be better at that. I need to shore that up. There are steps that I need to be taking and actions I need to have in my life that are going to produce that. And friends, that's where we get completely off track. Completely. Completely. See, the Pharisees thought that through the law that they could be right. Jesus Christ said, you study the scriptures because in them you think you have life. They're not bringing you to me. The one who's going to give you life. See, the law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Do you remember when Satan was on the mount and, and, he, and Jesus was fasting? Do you realize that one of the ways he tempted Jesus was with the word of God? It was with the word of God. Was the word of God being spoken in truth? Yeah. No. It was being handled improperly. The devil was speaking the word of God falsely, but it was still the word of God. It was still exactly what it says, but it was being spoken falsely. The Pharisees were studying the scriptures. They were seeking to obey God. They were seeking to have a relationship with God of righteousness and doing the things that God wanted and having a peace with God. But yet, it was all convoluted. And when Christ was in their midst, they were condemning him because he wasn't seeking righteousness the way they sought righteousness. And they put him down and didn't realize that's the word of God. He's the one that was inspiring the word to be spoken and written. He was the embodiment of what was written, and they didn't recognize. Why not? Why not? It goes back to the beginning of what Jesus was saying. Friends, if you start to analyze these things as if they are compartmentalized, that they are separate from one another, you're going to miss the fact that what Jesus was teaching were the steps to walk and live in obedience to God. You will never come to the place where when you are persecuted falsely that you will actually have any rejoicing and gladness if you don't begin with being poor in spirit. It begins there. It has to begin there. It is the foundation of the relationship. Amen. To whom do the, does the Lord look? Isaiah says, to him who is of a poor and contrite spirit and trembles at my word. The heart is what allows there to be a blessing. The heart is what has to be worked with first. So if you're trying to work out being a peacemaker, or man, I need to be more merciful, friends, you're on a fool's errand if that's where you're starting. If your thinking is what you've got to change to be more merciful, and it has to do with dealing with mercy, you've got to know that where the problem is is going back to first step. It's first step. The only way to master the second step is doing the first step. See, when you're poor in spirit, you realize what? I got nothing here, God. I have nothing. Nothing. See, so often what happens in life, the sins that we were talking about last week, the generational sins, how they went and confessed the sins of their fathers, what happens is your fathers don't bear the responsibility for your sin. 
But what happens is the fruit of the sin comes to you and you start pushing back and dealing with the sins of your father. And now you're fighting that war. You're fighting that battle. You have figured out in a way in the flesh how to do it from your very youth. And by the time you get to a teenager, man, we all have all these messed up things because all the sins of our parents have now been ingrained in us. We're trying to figure out how to fight them, right? We're trying to defend ourselves, trying to protect our hearts from being hurt. And all this work is going on and we've been doing it in the flesh. And we've learned how to cope. So here's one of the things that happens. There are those of you in here that you had whacked out parents. They were in sin. They were filled with laziness, drunkenness, drug abuse, sexual immorality, poverty, you name it, whatever manner of sin, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But now as a kid, you have to deal with that, right? You're under the authority of that. So what you start doing is you're fighting the authority because the authority has been bad, has been negative. There are those of you in here that still are dealing with evaluating God by how your parents were or evaluating God by how you overcame your parents in the flesh. So you realize that your parents were messed up. Your parents weren't encouraging you to be godly. Your parents weren't encouraging you to be the person God made you to be. So what did you have to do? Forget you. I'm going to do this because I do it this way. You're lazy, I'm a workaholic. You're a drunkard, I never drink. You do drugs, I never touch them. Who would do that? You have sexual immorality, I'm never going to do that. And you can set up in your flesh a whole working provision for how you are going to defend yourself against sin. And one of the worst things that can happen to a person who has the strength, power, and discipline from God to do that is you can develop a whole life without God. You can develop a whole life without God because you were successful in your flesh defending. And it's really hard to come and say, I am nothing. I am destitute of power. I've got nothing. See, at the core of our being, if we're still saying, no, 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 you're right, God, you're better than me, but, but I got, I, I'm, I'm good 80%. It's just the 20 you need to deal with. Oh, God, God, all right, 50-50. But I am 50 good. 20%. Let me have my 20% of good. 20% God, I did that. I was good in that way. And that is the little place of idolatry that can end up weakening the whole foundation and destroying everything. And you may not notice it in mourning, meekness, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You might be hungering and thirsting for righteousness. I want to do exactly what God says. But at the core of the being, there's still this, but I'm good. I was good in this way. I did this right. I did it. And so the whole foundation is a mess. And then by the time you get to those last things that Jesus is saying is, blessed are you when you're reviled and persecuted for my name's sake, when people speak against you falsely, not even close to being there. You're never going to be close to being there because the foundation of poverty of spirit is the only way you will ever get there. It's the 100% of poverty in spirit that allows you to take abuse that is unwarranted, unmerited, and even totally, totally false and to take it and to rejoice about it. Because if you're still fighting life, if you're still fighting to have your own life, even just 10% of it. If you're still fighting to keep you alive in there, in your flesh, in your power, you're going to have a portion of you that's going to get offended. You're going to have a portion of you that's going to get mad. You're going to have a portion of you that's going to fight back. So all these things that we read about, about being hungering and thirsting for righteousness, being merciful, being peacemakers, being able to absorb persecution, and look to God, we have no chance unless we have the right 
foundation of what Jesus was laying here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who mourn. Why do you mourn? Because when you come to the end and your heart says, I got nothing here, God. I realize I'm powerless. I'm powerless to be a good husband, a good man, a good father, a good brother, a good son, good daughter, whatever it is. When you realize that, do you know where that takes you? Morning. Morning. Right? I'm going to hold my place here in Matthew chapter 5. Turn with me quickly over to James. James chapter 4. Notice this with me. James chapter 4. Verse 6, it says this, But God gives more grace. Woo! Yes. That's the blessing that comes from God, that God gives grace to come into our lives. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, this is what I've been saying. I've been trying to say it in different ways. I'm going to say it another way. If you're coming for prayer and looking for God to take away your sin, but you are not poor in spirit, it's not going to work. And I'm going to tell you why. Because you have to be able to submit to God in order to receive the blessings of God. Even this is a work of God and God's grace. But there has to be a humbling of self because if in your pride you still believe what's false, guess what comes out of that heart? False. It's the seed that comes out. It has to. So when you come for prayer and you, you go through, I keep wanting to overcome, I keep wanting to overcome, and years and years go on and you're having trouble and struggling, overcoming, and it's, where's the power of God to take this from me? We have to go back to the foundations. Where did I not die? Where have I not mourned? Notice the definition and the expounding of this. It's like the grief, as is described, over the hope that dies. The hope of what? That I am good, that I am the champion, that I am the victor. You see, when we find in the fruit of our lives that we are sinning and walking in false ways, it's right here at the core of our being that we have to be challenged. Are we mourning over these sins? Are we mourning over the fact that I have been sinning? Why am I dealing with people with wrath or anger? Why am I going to these vices? And we have to come into our own heart with the Lord God Almighty. And what he says is, okay, you can see it's not working, right? Amen, poor in spirit. Here's why it's not working. You've got to be willing to ask, why am I acting this way? You have to be willing to look and say, because I think that makes me happy. And I like the way it feels when I do it. It feels good sometimes to blow off steam and yell at somebody. It feels good sometimes to blow off God's word and go after some vice or something else in this world. It feels good. It, it, it makes our flesh feel comforted. But what did Jesus say? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. If we start to see the lowliness of heart and we start to enter in with God into our own spirit and we see the sinfulness that we love, that defines our life, who am I if I don't have this sin? This sin's defined me for 20 years. And we start to feel the loss that we're dying and we start to grieve, who am I? What do I do now? I don't know where to go. My whole life has been about going to the track and gambling. My whole life has been about going to the bar to get drunk. And now you're saying those things that I love and like and I'm so involved in and have held me in bondage, you got to be free. Well, then who am I? You're going to mourn the loss. You're going to be confronted with your sin. You're going to be confronted and it's going to hurt. It'll hurt because you realize you're not all that. It's going to hurt because you realize you're not good. It's going to hurt because you realize that I like the things that are not good, and I know they're not good, but I still like them. And that's where God has to come in. But you've got to receive the morning. You've got to. You've got to be willing to mourn. Notice then the instruction of James. So God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Poor in spirit. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 
Stop believing his lies. Stop believing those things are good for you. I know you think they're good. I know you think they're fun. God says, no, they're not. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, your sinners. You sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn. Same word as in Matthew. And weep. Lament, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. If you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? So we also have to be aware of that. Do you see how that works? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up but not lifting you up to be a judge of another. Not puffing you up, lifting you up to bring you to a different place. But this is part of the process that has to come. It's very much what Jesus was teaching. So notice, so you mourn over that part. And what does that produce the, when you are poor in spirit and when you are mourning? That's where the meekness comes from. Meekness does not precede being poor in spirit or mourning. I'm getting updates here from ESPN. I don't know what's going on with that. <laughs> I took it off my iPad and not my phone, obviously. One of the things, friends, one of the things. So, to be meek, gentle spirit that has surrendered to God, that is teachable, accepts God's direction without resisting or disputing. You aren't going to begin with meekness. You're going to begin with poverty of spirit, mourning over your sins, because what do you need to be? You need to be at the place where you're like, show me then, right? You have to have that heart that's ready to change. And then what do you have? That's what creates the hungering and thirsting for righteousness. The hungering and thirsting comes because what God has built in you is meekness. If you jump in your life to say, yeah, those things are harder to deal with, poor in spirit, it seems so, I don't really all get it. And then you jump to mourning, well, I don't really want to cry over things, and, and I don't really want to dig into the painful things of my life and the way I've been living. Let me just jump ahead to the hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You can learn a lot. You end up being a Pharisee. That's the basic spirit of the Pharisee that was walking. They weren't humble enough to see God in front of them. They were still thinking that they could become righteous. They still thought that taking of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil was going to make them whole and give them life. The, the word of God is valuable and precious and is necessary, but it comes then. Now here, I want to address something on the other side. Because if you somehow have concluded that, hey, it's not about obedience to God. It's not about obeying his commandments and keeping his commandments. It's just about having poverty of spirit, mourning, and meekness. And you stop there, well, you're missing something too. Because the grace that comes from God to make us poor in spirit and give us the heart to mourn and lament and gives us the meekness by which we come, well, then he wants to fill it with what's actually really good. And that's where the truth comes in. Now, the hungering and thirsting for righteousness becomes so powerful because you're taking of God and he's replacing it in the core of your being where all the beliefs are that make you who you are. Everything that comes out of your life is based on a core belief. Everything. So what you do, what you think, what you value, it's all because you believe something. When you find that what you're doing is not right, you have to be honest and say, I'm believing something wrong. If you see the same sins happening over and over and you're praying and saying, God, take it away. He said, well, then submit to me. Let me have the idol because you're asking me to be God for part of your life and to re free you from something, but you keep worshiping the wrong thing. You keep worshiping your own righteousness. You keep worshiping your own vice. You keep thinking that smoking that weed, taking that drug, whatever it is, that entertainment, that television, that you name it, you know what it is that that somehow is going to provide you something good, better than God can. That's a lie. It's a lie. So the hungering and thirsting for righteousness has to come. 
So if you find anyone who is spiritual and they're directing you to not obey God's commandments, not keep God's word, run. (laughs) You're on a bad path. You started well, but you took a veering. What does he say? Here's the patience of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So if you have any question about that, if you're saying, no, no, we don't really need to keep those commandments, you don't really need to stop your work on the Sabbath, it's all right to be coveting and and selfish ambition and all that, please come and talk to me privately. Give me the opportunity to serve you with the Word of God because I'll tell you, you're believing something not true. You're believing something not true. The Word of God speaks plainly. All right. I want you to look at these again. What gives you the ability to be merciful? Poor in spirit, you have mourned over your own sins. Friends, if you have not come to the place where you are impoverished of spirit before God and mourning over all the evil that's been and done in your life, your mercy is going to be in shades, but never whole. You won't be full of mercy. You'll be partially merciful. You'll be merciful at times and unmerciful at other times because there's not an appreciation for how much mercy you've received. It starts with the beginning. So if you find that you are not a very merciful person, that you don't find compassion flowing from your heart, if you don't see love, you've got to go back to the beginning because just trying to be more merciful won't work. That's your flesh. It comes from the brokenness. And here's what's so great. Let me get you to the end of the story before we even get to the end of the story. Because when God lives in our hearts and he's guiding us because we've we've impoverished ourselves before him, we recognize and agree and confess. We assent to the fact that we need God and we mourn over everything that has been contrary to him. And he generates in us this meekness that comes from his ministry and work with us. Do you know what starts to happen? These things just come out. Because it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's not you working it up, trying to make yourself the better person, trying to obey God in the flesh, wondering what you're doing, judging other people for not doing what you're doing, and you're thinking of everybody the wrong way because you're not looking at God first. And the pride that comes in when you look and you take God's law and you use it to be judging and condemning and critiquing, you stop being a doer. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm ignorant of the fact that Hey, if you're fornicating, you're sinning. But what it means is my intention toward that person is to help them come to what? Be poor in spirit. All the sins of the world that we can try to battle at the high levels, friends, you can battle there all day long. Do you know where you got to go? Poor in spirit. You've got to begin at the foundation of belief. So when you're trying to bring people to Christ and you're condemning them for all the sins that they do, condemn away. Right, let, me, let me ask you, how effective does that get? That's a last resort when you confront. But where you need to help the person go is to be impoverished of spirit before the Lord God Almighty to see the sin and the lie they believe, to help them see the truth. Because when they mourn and they give up everything to God, they die to themselves. Now, Now they can obey because the obedience will come by the power of God and not the flesh. When you see in your life, I see in my life, that sins are still springing up, acknowledge the fact in some way I haven't died to self. In some way I'm not poor in spirit and I'm not mourning over these things. I'm rejoicing in them. I'm making place for them. But know that the good news is That when he fills with the Spirit, it becomes the essence of who you are because it's a nature change. It's a thinking change at the core that is lasting. He said, you cleanse the outside of the cup, the inside is still dirty. Cleanse the inside, the outside will be clean too. That's what Jesus was telling. So stop trying to mess with the outside of the cup when you see sin. Go back to the core. Go back to this. Friends, this never ends. You realize this. Just because I was poor in spirit yesterday doesn't mean I'm poor in spirit today. Doesn't mean I'll be poor in spirit tomorrow. Just because I mourned at my sins yesterday doesn't mean I'll mourn today or tomorrow. What if I backslide? What if I go back? What if I forget and try to take those idols that God was removing back into my life? I'll be right back. Right back to where I was before. Okay? So realize the process that's working out. Pure in heart. Why? Because who is in your heart? 
God. Blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. You see God, you become pure in heart. There's no one that can transform you from a person you are today to the person he wants you to be other than just seeing God. He makes you pure. He makes you holy. Peacemakers. Why? Because I'm not looking to propagate what the world does. I see what Christ did. He put an end to cursing. He brought the curse on himself that we could be the righteousness of God. I join him in that, and therefore I'm a son of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Because you're doing what is right, it is not dependent on any other person. You can curse me. You can talk ill of me. You can say, Liesenfeld talks too long. You can say whatever you want to say. But see, we have to do what we do out of obedience to God. We have to love others because of our love for God. God is looking how we do that in our relationship with other people. Turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, it says this in First Peter chapter 3. Wives, be submissive to your own husbands. I'm going to tell you what, being submissive to your husband or being submissive to anybody, as it says in Ephesians 5, where it says, submit yourselves to one another in the fear of God, impossibility without poverty of spirit. It's impossible. If that's not the foundation, you'll never be genuinely submissive. And in fact, what does the world teach you, ladies, about being submissive to anybody? They actually contradict this verse all the time. That's the ingrained nature of this world. You realize that. This is looked at as weakness when actually I will, it, 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 is, it is complete strength when you understand it. Be submissive to your own husbands, for even if some do not obey the word. What? Wait. I thought submission was conditioned on how they're acting. No, didn't say that. So even if they're not obeying the word, why? What is God wanting to work out? If we're thinking that, hey, they're not obeying God, I need to not obey God and fight back, what do we have? Strife, conflict, lack of mercy, unforgiveness, warfare, all manner of evil. That's the world we live in. When sin comes in, to receive it, to to surrender to the Lord, to take what the Lord gives and push it back. It's not conditioned on you. Friends, that's why Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. If somebody asks for your tunic, give, them, give it to them. If somebody wants you to go, you know, one more, go to. Let them show a different way. Show a different way. It's a different way of thinking. It's kingdom thinking. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when you're persecuted and reviled for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who are pure. Blessed are those who are peacemakers. It's all about his kingdom. So that even when they do not obey the word, they without a word, notice that, not arguing, may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, and putting on their fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. That word gentle is the same word in Matthew 5 that says, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. A beauty of a meek, Gentle, what is that? Teachable, quiet spirit. How does God look at that? It's very precious in the sight of God. Very precious. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God so adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Do you see the the heart of that? As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands, likewise, Do you notice that? Likewise, guys, that's for us. Same spirit. The same adornment of a spirit of meekness, right? It's not that we get to lord it over or be abusive of authority. In fact, we need to be laying down our lives for our wives. 
Dwell with them with understanding. That's hard to do, isn't it? It takes poverty of spirit. If you're having trouble understanding your wife, we have to go back to poverty of spirit. We have to go back to mourning and, and saying, God, I've been living by a lie. Giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Notice that, as God had preached with the chainsaw, that they be not cut off. Right? Finally, all of you, be of one mind. This one mind is what? A submissive mindset, right? He told the ladies, he told the men, this is the way we think. It's a submissive, meek, gentle attitude. Be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Friends, you are going to see people screw up in this church. You're going to see me screw up. I'm dependent on your mercies. You realize this. I am. I am. If our church becomes that everything gets judged and, it, and it's, it's, it's not met with compassion when there's turning and repentance, that's not the church we want to be a part of. Sometimes you have to put out the evil person. Sometimes you put out the person that is filled with rage or pride or disobedience to God. They, they don't have a place in the fellowship. But when one is brought in, in, to God and, and this is the sin and there's a turning, it should be met with compassion, with tenderness, with love. And all the while our desire for that person is reconciliation to God and salvation. Verse 9, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing that you give God's grace. That's what I was saying. Somebody reviles you, give it to the cross of Christ. Jesus took it. Jesus, give me your peace and bless them with that. Blessing is that which comes directly or indirectly from God. You and I are to be messengers and deliverers of that peace, knowing that you were called to this. Now that even makes it more powerful, doesn't it? This is your calling, that you were called to do this, that you may inherit a blessing for he who would love life and see good days. Let him refrain his tongue from evil, his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. See, that's in our relationships. And how do we do that? By being poor in spirit, mournful attitude, meekness. That's the only way. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. He's against those who do evil. We let it, God have it. The judgment's his for him to work it out. So when we go through this process, we saw, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who are mourned, blessed are those who are meek, on it goes. It's a process of building from one beginning to an end of who we are in Christ. When we find that we're messing up on the back end of that list, go back to the front end. That's where it's going to be solved. But realize this. Remember, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are mourning. They will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. They will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. They will be filled. What is God showing? He's right there to minister in this process that God leads us to, he's helping us to see these things so he can minister to us. That's what he really wants. That's the way all this works. It's the ministry of Christ in our lives to deal with us every step of the way. It's really about his work to create in us a new person who thinks completely different than this world. God wants to take us to that place. That's what he wants us to see. If you find that you are in need of prayer today, there'll be people available to pray with you. If it needs to be a prayer that you want in private, in the back of the church, outside, in a room, wherever, come and ask somebody to pray. My desire is that you would receive prayer if you need it, to go to somebody that you feel comfortable with and ask them, I ask if you're asked, don't think about yourself. Think about Almighty God and just let him lead the prayer and do the work. And I ask that we continue to think about these things foundationally because the only way to have love in a church is to have these foundational things in us that Christ taught. Amen.
Let's praise him.